We've all heard the stories. The software engineers and data scientists in Silicon Valley. Kids in their mid-twenties, fresh out of Stanford, making hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if you live somewhere removed from all of this, it almost doesn't seem real. Or at least not a world that's accessible to the common person. And if you're anything like I was, the idea that you might work for one of these companies didn't even seriously enter your consciousness. Or if it did, it was quickly dismissed because they only hire geniuses and the best of the best. And I would never have a PhD from Stanford. But let me tell you, that story in your head is not true. The hundreds of thousands of dollars are true, but even that can be very misleading. Let me tell you why. In this video, I want to talk about some of the misconceptions I had as a tech company outsider and some of the lessons I learned on my journey to becoming an insider. Before I dig in, let me mention that I have a mailing list that you can subscribe to to get updates about content I release across a variety of platforms, and a link to that is in the description. So this video is about tackling some of the myths I held in my head that ended up being self-limiting. So thoughts and assumptions that weren't just wrong or misguided, but that held me back in some way. And learning this lesson has been incredibly insightful, not just for the details around this topic, but because it reveals something about ourselves. This self-limiting part. The story we tell ourselves in our head that can shut down the idea of even considering. And this is the first lesson of my journey, that these self-limiting narratives in our head can exist and be very powerful because we never do what never occurs to us. So the first task is recognizing them when they occur and then challenging them. Let me tell you about the most powerful idea I have ever had and that changed my life entirely. It's very simple. Apply for the best job in the world, however you define that. And then apply for the second best job in the world. You know going in, you're probably not going to get the best job in the world, but something interesting happens you end up getting a vastly better job than had you merely looked for the most convenient way to take one step up. And here is why this is enormously powerful. Advantages accumulate, just like in compounding interest, that delivering something important now makes it easier to get the opportunity to work on the next more important thing. And the sooner you can get this advantage, the better, because the most valuable asset and compounding interest is time. Here's the second thing I discovered. It's not as hard as you think it is. All the people working for company X are not geniuses. The bar is a little higher, and if you're below average, you're gonna have a hard time getting hired, but you don't need to be in the top 0.1% of your field, not by a long shot. And the biggest surprise I had when I started interviewing at top companies was just how simple and straightforward the technical interviews were. I was expecting next level stuff, extra hard interviews, but what I found was that they were actually more straightforward than in lower tier companies usually. Rarely was someone trying to trick me or asking crazy riddles that had little to do with anything. Instead, they quizzed me on the technical fundamentals and then went on to evaluate my character. That brings me to the third discovery, that you're character is more important than your current state of knowledge. Because a person with strong work ethic will tend to learn whatever it is they need to learn to get the job done. That's grit. That burning feeling inside to get to the bottom of things and to solve the problem. And that's why so many interview questions start with, tell me about a time when, because the best companies are looking for people that have a history of solving tough problems, and they reflect that in their hiring. You, of course, need basic technical competence to be well-versed in the fundamentals and to speak the language, but you also need to be a doer, not a person that talks about doing and makes excuses for what got in their way or 
a person waiting for job title or authority to do things, but rather someone that takes ownership end to end, whether they have the authority or not. And then not a person that just writes the code to meet the requirements or trains the model and the data, but asks the tough questions like, but what is this for? And how does it fit into our core mission? And you don't need a PhD or to have gone to a top tier school or anything else to do that. You merely need to choose to have that level of standard for yourself and for your work, and then build things. And if you build things and take ownership and have examples that might span school or side projects or anything else, then you're 95% of the way there. And the next step is to apply for lots and lots of great jobs because it's a long process with a lot of rejection, even for people that you might think are a shoo-in. And that's my fourth lesson, that this is a numbers game, so start playing. It took me over 100 applications and eight months of interviewing, and that's with a master's degree and multiple years of experience from a reputable company. Lastly, let me talk about the money myth. It's true that compensation packages can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, usually a mix of base salary, stocks, and bonuses. And if you're sitting in middle America, you might think, wow, that's more money than I could ever spend. Maybe I'd buy a Porsche and a super nice house. But that's where the narrative breaks down because these jobs are typically in cities like San Francisco, Seattle, New York, and it's very expensive to live there. I made significantly less than $100,000 when I lived in the Midwest and I owned a pretty nice house. When I moved to Texas, I got a big raise, but costs more or less increased proportionately. And when I moved to Seattle, I got another big raise and once again, costs more or less increased proportionately. That $200,000 house became a million dollar house. So let's just say the Porsche is still not in the driveway and now I don't even own the driveway. So if you wanna get rich, start a company. It's not gonna happen by drawing a salary at a tech company. But also, this doesn't matter. The reward of this job is not in getting rich. And that's the last lesson here, is that this is not about making more money. Maybe it's a little bit more, but after you compensate for the cost of living adjustment, it's unlikely to be life-changing sums of money compared to a similar role at an average company in a different part of the country. The real reward of this job is in the work and the people you get to work with, the things that you'll get to do and the things that it will unlock for you to do next. So to summarize, you should carefully consider the idea of pursuing a top job, however it is you define that, because it can unlock a tremendous amount of opportunity for you in the rest of your career. And if you decide to do this, it doesn't matter that you don't have a PhD from a top school, because that is not a requirement, even if it says so in the job posting. The types of skills you need to stand out are the ones that you don't learn in a lecture hall. They define your character and your work ethic, and they can be practiced and developed. So have high standards for your work, build things, and then apply to jobs. And if you combine this recipe with patience and persistence, it's hard to imagine any outcome except for success. So I hope this helps. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about working in tech.